So once again, thank you everyone for turning up uh, to the Bar Shop Seminar Series. Uh, today it's a great pleasure to be introducing Dr. Steve Britton, who comes from the University of Mission, Michigan uh, Medical School, and he is a uh, professor there, jointly appointed in the Department of Anesthesiology as well as Molecular and Integrated Physiology. He joined the faculty as a full professor in 2006. Four. Four. There we go. Okay. Uh, anyway, so uh, Steve is probably best known for his work uh, on the establishment, involving the establishment of a, uh, uh, what's turned out to be a, a quite interesting rat model. And I think uh, most of us have, are aware of athletes in their 70s and 80s. And one of the things that sticks out about those folk is that they're often uh, very healthy and they come with uh, very few, if any, age-related diseases. So the model that uh, Steve, has, and along with his collaborator, Dr. Uh, Lauren Gerard uh, Koch, es established back in 96, I think it was, was, will answer those kind of questions. It'll give us an insight as to why these, why, what, what is it about uh, these people that being uh, fit, or as what we would we would uh, describe as uh, robust, uh, confer health benefits to a whole variety of age-related diseases. So on that note. Well, thank you. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, is this, uh, I, I can't, tell. all right, thank you. Uh, th thank you, Shane. R really glad to be here in San Antonio to share, share the ideas and and I, I, I guess this is sometimes a, just a little informal where you ask questions during it. So I've been married for 42 years, so I'm real used to being interrupted. So feel, feel free. Uh, uh, starting, in about, starting in 1982, I was influenced by the quantitative geneticist John Rapp, and he can easily be described as the pioneer of mammalian genomics. In, indeed, he was doing... Uh, genome-wide association studies back in the 1970s to try to resolve blood pressure in the dull salt-sensitive and salt, salt-resistant rats using RFLPs. And some of you might know what that stands for. But importantly, he stimulated me to think about animal models of complex diseases. And so, as you see, I, I started studying them, you know, just intellectually. But I, I could not grasp the logic. I didn't get it. It didn't register with me. And here were some of the initial problems. They just seemed too simplistic. Streptozidocin for diabetes. Uh, it's an alkylating uh, poison that has nothing to do with, with anything with, with diabetes. And th this is simply from the viewpoint of Lauren Koch and I who developed this. We were, we were thinking together. So this is just our, our, our view of the world. Uh, coronary artery. Uh, uh, occlusion for heart failure. It's nothing more than response to, response to injury, and I know I don't understand anything about what it has to do with the progression of heart failure. Uh, knock in, knock out, diseases don't occur that way. When you knock out a gene, what you're left with is everything functioning except that gene and the reorganization in its absence. Could not resolve, did not compute, uh, and then it goes on. And mutagenetics did not get what, what it was after, didn't see how it related to disease or how it was going to solve any of the problems. So that was our view. And, uh, but this, indeed, was a, was a, a part-time hobby. I was there on the faculty with John Rapp, and he was doing all of this work, and he could put in three years of worth of work, publish a paper. I could read the paper in three hours and then start to criticize. It was, it was actually a fun world. and it was, I was doing this simply as a hobby while I thought I was doing real science. So... Um, uh, in, indeed, an initial idea as part of this hobby effort uh, was to use artificial selection to create a low and high form for disease risks. This clearly came from John Rapp because John Rapp and Lou Dahl had, had selectively bred for salt-sensitive and salt-resistant rats. So John had set up the paradigm for me and how to go about it. And it was a great, great leap that, that he gave me to be able to, to, to talk to him every day, so to speak. But what trait would tell us the most about disease? We went searching and made guidelines, kind of rough guidelines. We said the model must emulate an important clinical phenotype or phenotypes to be polygenic, respond to positive and negative health environments. And number four, and this is the one that really got us in, in, in trouble and Lauren Koch drove us into trouble with this, be explained by fundamental scientific principles. 
that is, you know, principle-based biology, theory-based biology of, of which we, we didn't know what we were talking about. Uh, but we did know that we wanted the approach to be explanatory and, and predictive. That was, that was one of the, the, the major goals. Uh, an idea emerged about 1988. We envisioned a connection between disease and evolution that might have mechanistic value. And the connector, connector was energy metabolism in the middle with evolution on one side and disease on the other. And you'll see how it originated from this and re resolving the clinical side was simply from teaching medical students and them asking me, is exercise good for you? 1984, I was asked it for the first time. An old-fashioned thing that professors would do, if you didn't know for certain the answer, you'd go to the literature, and I started reading the literature. And there was Claude Bouchard and, and, and Cooper, and there was, a, there was a small literature out. We called it small literature, but it connected strongly uh, d disease with low aerobic function. And it, and it was pretty, pretty, uh, pr pretty impressive literature that had gone unnoticed a, a little bit. And on this basis, we formulated the energy transfer hypothesis, and it reads, Variation in capacity for energy transfer is a central mechanistic determinant of the divide between disease and health. And, and th th this, is, this is broad and pretty worthless in, in itself unless you think you're going to be able to do something with it. But it was a, a, a guiding help for us. And the other thing that was perplexing to us at the time was the wide-ranging influence of exercise. It, it influenced diabetes and heart failure and cancer and depression and anxiety, and the list went on and on and on, and I hardly believed the literature. I thought, I didn't think people were making up data. I just thought, they're being too hopeful, and I didn't think that there could be this connection, but it was an interesting one, because it's actually, of course, something that you can, that you can do. It's a prescription that can be, uh, can be applied. And so I, I was lukewarm on the whole thing, but, but w w wanting to try to under, uh, understand this. Uh, okay, and thinking about it more, marching forward in time, we actually started doing something that was, that was concrete, Clearly, with the help of, of, of John Rapp. In 1990. Yes. How, how do you, how did you back then or even now, it doesn't matter, define capacity for energy transfer? What does that mean? Okay, we went to, to the clinic and, and took uh, people running on a treadmill to estimate their VO2 max. And, and so we emulated that, and so we took treadmill running to exhaustion in a rat as a surrogate for energy transfer capacity. That's, you know, we, we, we didn't know of anything any larger that we could do and anything better that we could measure. So that, that it, was, it was pretty simple. As, as, as a young person, I had worked in the clinic and performed the Bruce Protocol with people. So as, as you'll see, we call it the, you know, the, the rat equivalent of the Bruce Protocol. It was, it was very straightforward. And that was, that was an easy part for us. Uh, so in 1992, we formulated that two-way artificial selection for low and high exercise capacity would test the energy transfer hypothesis, okay? That is, would disease risk segregate with artificial selection for low capacity energy transfer? And over here, in an idealized fashion, here's uh, the, the N and with a perfect, uh, sig with a, with a perfect uh, distribution, low to high capacity, you start with a large founder population. In this case, it was about 180 rats, heterogeneous rats. They're called uh, heterogeneous stock, or as originally called by Carl Hansen that, that sort of made these, the NNIH stock. And they're an outcross stock made from eight uh, different inbreds, and so they're, they're quite different uh, genetically. And so the idea, of course, is, is you, get, uh, you find 13 families of lows and 13 families of highs. And then just repeat this, read lows with lows, lows with lows, and highs with highs, and everybody understands the basic tenet of artificial selection. But that wasn't the experiment. We knew we were going to get high and low, runner, high and low runners because it's a polygenic trait, and it has worked essentially 100% of the time. Every time selection ha has been applied to something that's polygenic. So we knew we were going to get high and low runners. The question would be, for the low runners, would they have high disease risk, and would the high runners have low disease risk? And of course, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you if the answer was, it wasn't yes. The answer is yes. So, and then, if true, it would also yield mechanism-based contrasting models for study. That was, the, that was the real payoff. And indeed, this type of fundamental experiment, uh, this was the predictive type of approach that we sought. It's something that, that could be tested, and we predicted that this would happen. But it, it, it doesn't prove. It's still, a, it's still association. Okay? But we think a, a, a little tighter a, a association of testing this. Um, so, 
we, we had the clinical association side, and through a picture I'll show you of my collaborator, Lauren Cope, um, that, that really has taken us off to, to, to the dark side. We wanted a, a theory-based thing because both of us agreed uh, we thought it weak to move forward based only upon clinical association. We were going to have to go to large-scale selection. We envisioned this, as it turned out to be true, in thousands of rats. And we, we didn't want to start off from a weak standpoint. We wanted a base to stand upon. We wanted some theory to stand upon. No matter how, how tenuous it might be, it's better to have that and to be working on it than, than not to have that. And, and so um, here she is. Uh, Lauren Koch understood operating from first principles. And she was the driving force behind generating a, a theoretical base. And the stuff I'm going to tell you about in generating this is the outcome of arguing back and forth every day, constantly working on this, never know where we're, where we're going to be going. Um, and th th this was sort of the, the view. I, I for, for, for reasons uh, that, that were, oh, I'm, I'm very grateful for reasons. I, I started thinking a lot about physics and being around physicists and some high-level physicists, and they uh, completely convinced me to stop worrying about uh, top-down approaches and, and to work on something fundamental with a bottom-up approach. And, and indeed, th th this is a sketch of, you know, from 19, long, long ago. Fundamental principles that formulate hypotheses that, that predict the behavior of atoms and molecules that evolve into function via this type of function to produce the omics. And we, we thought... Uh, and indeed, out of this came the energy transfer hypothesis uh, in, in thinking about it. But of course, it really drove initially from, from the, the clinical ideas. And now we're trying to, 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 to mesh this with fundamental principles to have an explanatory note. And we saw no, no way, we saw no pathway for ever taking omics and coming back to fundamental principles. We just di didn't see that as a workable paradigm. And we, and we dismissed it and, and moved on. Um, we sought a principle-based explanation for the energy transfer hypothesis. And here I'm going to list. And th this is in a very linear path. I should say, be more careful, in a very nonlinear path. We connected ideas from Hans Krebs and Peter Mitchell and Linus Pauling and Ilya Prigogine as we kept drifting through the world, trying to get our wheels under us a, a, a little bit better, trying to get the think map to, to, to understand these rat models and, 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 and the content and also for hypothesis building. We, we thought this would be, we needed to formulate this as, as a basis. And, and so it would be, I, I, I wish I could tell you that we saw this clearly from the beginning, the path, but we didn't see anything clearly from the beginning, and it would be ridiculously disingenuous to ever, to ever insinuate that we had clarity of thought, except as a very bumbling thing as we were going along. But now in retrospect, it, it, it might have some content that you can, that you can criticize. So uh, I'm going I'm to lead you through this. So with, with, with evolution, and a lot of this, is, of course, life is what happens. This is, this is what happened to us while we were trying to, trying to uh, the, the term that we use sort of, we call it our think thread. What's the think thread? How, how do you pull this stuff together? So uh, Jack Baldwin and Hans Krebs published a paper entitled The Evolution of Metabolic Cycles uh, in Nature in 19, 1981. And, and, and I, I, I read this paper. Now it's I. Mostly it's we. But now it's I read this paper. And, and uh, two messages in, in, in this paper. Life evolves along the transfer of energy, and more complexity equates with more energy transfer. That was the, the message from the paper. This was what, what, what I got from, from reading the paper. And it, it's really sort of you don't get something for nothing paper. And I don't know why. I mean, I, I knew that. I didn't know why I needed Hans Krebs to tell me that. But this paper made the obvious perfectly clear. But importantly, it directed us towards using evolution and thermodynamics uh, as arguments, as, as, fundamental, as fundamental principles, to extract it from, from those entities. And indeed, th th this is a view. This is the view that, that I obtained from, from, from Hans Krebs. And here, here's a metabolic chart. And in the middle is the, the Krebs cycle. And Krebs, I guess, in this paper said it's not in the middle because Hans says it's, it is. It's because it, it, it's the central feature of how we evolved. And energy transfer capacity evolves simultaneously with all of the features. You have to have something to pay for the complexity and the function, and they can't happen independently. There, there have been 
widely debated theories on metabolism first and then replication. And that, that, that from when I was really, really young, I, I thought I'm missing something. I'm, you know, it would put me on the moon when I would see biology getting unraveled like that. They have to be, Lauren Koch calls it the parapassu principle. They have to occur simultaneously. You can't have one without the other. Something has to pay for the function and, and the complexity. Uh, taking this even further and brought, borrowing from Bruce Alpert's, to take, take away the names, and, and now it even has some information content, because here, here's a metabolic chart again, and here's glycolysis coming down through the middle, and here's, here, here's the Krebs cycle, and putting some names on it, of course, glucose, pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, very much interconnected and interwoven with functions related and unrelated to energy transfer. And of course, the, the purple line coming off here, since everyone but me has memorized this, you know that the product here, yeah, acetyl-CoA is a precursor for cholesterol. So this is the kind of view that we got from, from, from Hans Krebs. Um, the, 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 the next, indeed, was part of the serendipity living on terra firma. You'll see how this worked out. Uh, because we extended our approach to incorporate ideas from Peter Mitchell about ATP formation. Working on our own, this was a very improbable event because we got help from one of my friends and colleagues, Keith Garland, and also we got help from Peter Mitchell because they were friends and, and it's, it's, you know, everybody wants famous friends. Well, Peter, <laughs> you know, Keith Garland had a really nice famous friend who surprisingly would come to visit Toledo and he, he was popular, and it was nice to attend cocktail parties where, where Peter Mitchell was. And of course, Peter Mitchell uh, got famous for his the correct sequences of events, sort of, of the chemiosmotic hypothesis of, of ATP formation, as over here in the AT, ATP synthase step, as shown diagrammatically here. And I'm going to use this because discussions with Peter Mitchell were com completely unuseful in resolving the questions that I was after, but it kept me after the question. Remember, I'm not doing anything. We're not really doing much yet. Except think we, had, we had time to work over ideas, and so we were working over ideas. And indeed, here's, here, here's my colleague from, from, from Toledo, uh, Keith Garland, and uh, they were close personal friends. He, he was an MD biomathematician from Johns Hopkins, that they ended up liking each other on the face of the earth and, 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 and associating a lot. So Keith D. Garland uh, made me aware of the importance of Mitchell's hypothesis uh, and gave me a copy of his 1961 paper. So here I am in the 1980s. Why would I be reading a, you know, Mitchell's? Well, it's because Keith Garland told me it was important. We started talking about thermodynamic issues. And well, certainly in anticipation of the next visit for Peter Mitchell, I wanted to have something to talk to him about. And so you can see, this, you know. Um, so and here's the way that it that it went. I studied this paper, and, and th 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 this this is what fascinated me about the paper. I understood mostly the content of the paper until we get to the final paragraph. Okay. And at the end of this paper, Peter concluded that transport and metabolism may be conceived of as the same process. And, and if you go back to that, and it's a more complicated paragraph than that, but there's some language in there that is, that is really very confusing. I had no idea what, it, what he was talking about, how you could e equate the two. And so I tried to ask him about it, and never, he said, well, and then he, he, I never got an answer. And no, oh, by the way, part of the thing here, I, I didn't know at the time that he was mostly deaf. No, I'm, I'm, no he, he had had a surgical problem. And he was completely deaf in one ear and partially. So he, I, I, I thought, he's, you know, they were difficult conversations. If I would have known that, it would have been easier. But it was, they, were, they were difficult, strain conversations. And, and I, I thought, well, anyway, so you get the idea of it. So I was trying to ask Peter, and, and I came up with this on my own, and thinking about this, this AT, ATP formation. And, you know, it, it seemed like a critical event. And so sort of on my own, I... I said, Peter, do you mean that this diffusional gradient for hydrogen is a transport mechanism that connects with metabolism and ATP formation? And I, I, now I know why, I, you know, after the fact, I know why. He may have answered it, but I just didn't, didn't know it. Or maybe I didn't get the question to him clearly. In, in the midst, midst of this, in drawing pictures and trying to un understand this, uh, I, I, I did this. I said, well, maybe it's even more profound than that. And so 
with Lauren Koch, we thought it would be fun to think about the hydrogen gradient being an inanimate thing, you know, a nion moving kind of an inanimate. And, and then uh, th this is the animate step in forming ATP. So we thought, well, maybe this is integrally linked with, 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 with evolution and the original biogenesis of, of molecules that were able to, to then go on to evolve into life. And so you can see we were starting to, to get off on the dark side and, and, and think about real fundamental issues, and you'll see even about complexity as it unravels. Um, so uh, it, it, was, it was a pretty natural step to start thinking about um, uh, oxygen. And th th this, this was an easy, easy step for us because, uh, surprisingly, a 1932 paper became of critical importance for us to, to, to sort of ponder. So, because we sort of started with the obvious, saying that, that oxygen is special in the universe for energy transfer. It operates at the high end of the energy spe spectrum. That is, it ranks number two in electronegativity amongst all elements of, of the universe. And so, uh, Pauling put out this paper, the relative electronegativity uh, of, of atoms, where he ranked the periodic chart from lowest uh, to highest on the Pauling scale of 0 0.7 to 3.98. And here's, here's a periodic chart arranged not by molecular weight or something, but by uh, the, the Pauling electronegativity sc scale. With here, here's francium down here at 0 0.9 and fluorine up here at 4.1. And then here's carbon, which is eighth highest in electronegativity in, in, in the universe that we, that, that we know about. And essentially, energy transfer is, is basically an electron shuttle between oxygen and carbon, at least for things that have evolved here on life. That is, with photosynthesis, electrons go to carbon. With resp respiration, electrons to oxygen. So we just sort of simplified this to try to get the big view of where oxygen fits in and how important it, it, it could be for evolution. This is the thing that we were after. What's, what are some relationships here, and what can we, we do about it? So that was an important paper for us. Now. Uh, as a heuristic, okay, when you, when you collaborate with someone over a long time, you, you get little habits of things that you do. And, and as a heuristic, Lauren Koch and I said, if we think we understand something, we should be able to present it either as a one-page summary or, or as a, as a one-page picture. And if you can't do it in that space, you don't understand it well enough, and you have to go back and work on it. And so th 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 this is what we, what we did. Uh, we synthesized biocomplexity and Earth's oxygen history to a one-page picture, and we were able to do it. And I, I, I can't, I, I can't go through all of these papers, but in, in these papers, we were able to extract uh, uh, information from Paul Falkowski and Henry Holland and David Catling and Blair Hedges, and also working with Jason Shu on this to, to, to formulate this. And this came out as a as a white paper, our, our first white paper in in, in 2008, and, and it, it goes goes like this. The x-axis down here, here, here's today, here's backing up 4.6 billion years ago, and over here, it's a double axis. The, the blue is atmospheric oxygen in millimeters of mercury, and so here we're coming along. Before oxygenic photosynthesis, there, there was essentially zero oxygen, most certainly in the atmosphere. The great oxidation event came along, oxygen came up to 15 millimeters of mercury, and then it, it rose fast, and then it went down. This is called Romer's Gap. This high peak, I, I like saying this, it's the era of insect gigantism. The insects got, you know, of course, they, they, don't, they, they breathe through the fusion, and, and they respire through the fusion. And so they got up to 10 times larger during this era because of the influence of increased not, uh, atmospheric pressure. And then down to today at 150 millimeters of mercury, that's about zero, you know, zero point a fractional part of our 760 millimeters of mercury minus water pressure. So here we are. So this is our oxygen history. And then along here, in the white dots, are the number of cell types. And we, we just simply are taking this as a surrogate for complexity. Okay, And this is mostly from, from, from protein sequence, molecular clockwork that was put together. And we, we borrowed these from, from, from the paper and plotted it on the same time scale. And there's some relationship here between uh, uh, oxygen uh, and complexity, taking it as the number of cell types that, that have evolved. A little bit as an operational definition uh, by Jason Chu as, as to what, it, as to what a, a different, different cell type can be. And so the big picture is that up to 
two billion years ago. There was no oxygen, so we had anaerobic metabolism, that is glycolysis, and it was perfectly fine, and things were pretty, pretty complex. But then when oxygen, uh, that is when we were anaerobic plus aerobic, uh, there's this idea uh, that th th this was what was needed in the energy step to take us from unicellular events to multicellular complexity. Once again, this is just an association that we had, we had fun putting this uh, picture together. Uh, does, does anyone know the name of Ilya Prigogine? Yeah, I, I, I have to tell you, for, for Lauren Koch and I, he, he, he ranks with better explanation than Charles Darwin when it comes to events within evolution. He's been he come critical for, for, for our thinking, for resolving things at the cause and effect level. And th this, this is the worst part and the thing we understand the least, but it's the thing we're working on the hardest to try to understand. Uh, and we're, we're going to, anyway, we're going to get help from, from people on this. Because the, the thing that we saw lacking in every biological discussion w was ideas about complexity. Okay? How, how did we get so complex and so far from equilibrium? And so we started looking into the literature for, for ex explanations, and Ilya Prigogine, his work rose up as, as being a real guidepost for us. And I'll, I'll take you through this, and, and, and uh, you have to be assured, I really don't understand this, but I can assure you, Ilya Prigogine really never didn't understand it either, but he was willing to tackle the problem, to come up with plausible explanations that you could build upon. And I, and I, 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 think, I, I think this has been a, a, a real sign of having long-term collaboration that we allow each other and help each other work on things that we don't completely understand. When I was young, I wanted to understand everything, and now I'm willing to work on things that I don't understand to try to, to resolve issues. So everything about life is complex and far from e equilibrium. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it, we're absurdly far from what I can tell. We wanted to take, we wanted to take some aspect of this into consideration in our, in our uh, think thread. And I, I just drew a picture. Well, what, what do we mean? Well, here are every cell, 10 billion cells of the body. Look, look how far out of equilibrium. You know, this is common knowledge. Sodium, potassium, calcium out of equilibrium, 10,000 to 1. How, how, how did this occur? And what's an explanation for it? And, and I, I don't know. I, I don't want my biology to move on without at least trying to address this, even in a, in a, in a, in a bad manner. Um, so, yet, uh, I, I didn't know anything about non-equilibrium thermodynamics at, at the time, and everything, but yet everything about classical thermodynamics, that is for closed systems that I'd, that I'd been taught, places complexity as something like life close, close to zero. So what, 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 what do you do? Well, you have to abandon classical thermodynamics and go to something else, and Ilya Prigogine and others had, had been willing to, to do this. Now, I'll, I'll, everyone knows this. I, I, I know that you know it, but I'll put a picture in, in your mind, you know, from almost sixth grade. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics, uh, uh, that energy disperses with time as estimated by entropy. Entropy is related to the heat term, dq, divided by temperature. And here's for a closed system. Uh, as far as we know, you always go from hotter to colder, and you never reheat the water. It never comes back in the other, in the other direction. And th 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 this, is, um, this is what en entropy is, things becoming, uh, going from organization to a decrease in organization from where there is energy to where there isn't energy. And, but, you know, there are exceptions to this. This is, this is, this is the problem. I, I, can't, I can't begin to tell you. My son, who's a quantum physicist, has told me, oh, there's two exceptions to this at, at, at micro levels. And I, I'm, I tried to, that I don't understand. I'm, I'm accepting this as being true all of the time. But of course, life is not a closed system. We operate in an open system. We operate in an o open system with, with, the, with the universe. And so something else, something else ha has to take its, take its place. And so, we approached the, 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 we call it the, the vague world of Ilya Prigogine. He died long before we, we got to thinking about this, or I would go, we'd, we'd, go, we'd go right over to Belgium and visit him. He got a Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work on energy dissipation. 
and a statement that he made is non-equilibrium thermodynamics leads to general, general results independent of any specific molecular model. And I'll give you the, the two tenets and the summary of it. And uh, he said that life is one example of specification of the general results of non-equilibrium thermodynamics. What Ilya Prigogine wanted to, to explain is what is the fundamental behavior of atoms and molecules of the Earth. And it's something that's very difficult to observe, but I'm, I'm going to give you an example of it. But he says it, it, it's, it, it's a property, okay? And, and the property is energy dissipation. That's what they do. And I'll, I'll show you, you can use these ideas. So the summary of Prigogine's conclusions are that systems tend to organize to a higher complexity when the resulting system can dissipate energy faster than the independent parts. We're constantly uh, of course, if they're doing that, they're creating more entropy. But, but momentarily, you get, as we'll see, the term neg negative entropy, and things become complex so that more energy can be transferred. And entropy uh, can decrease and ordered systems can form. That's a conclusion. If you know the term order from disorder, this is, this is Ilya uh, Prigogine. And until I started reading him and he came up with some examples of what the heck is he talking about at a level that I could understand it, we, we didn't know what to do with it, but, but he did. Oh, and may, some of you may have read this book called What is Life? It, 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 uh, it, a lot of biologists, it, it influenced uh, James Watson and a lot of people in, in thinking about biology. And th this is from uh, Erwin Schrodinger, the quantum physicist. And, he says, the central feature of life is extracting order from the environment, order from, from disorder. And, and indeed, he, in, in his book, he talked about negative entropy, order from disorder. And he, and he coined the term neg entropy. It's kind of hard to say. Neg Excuse um, me. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, I'm just curious. I haven't, um, you know, since my undergrad years, I haven't, you know, refreshed these ideas. And I was wondering if you know whether the work of um, Dr. Prigozhin had been extended by other people or whether you're going to touch upon that? Yeah. Um, I, I'll show you some extension of it. And it, it's, a, it's a huge it, it, it extension of the work of, of, of Ilya Prigozhin. On, I'll, I'll show you this thing next, and I'm going to talk about thermodiffusion. But there, there's, there's hundreds of papers okay. on it. Yeah. I'll, I'll fill you in on, on w one example that's kind of tractable and kind of understandable. So here's a concrete example of order from disorder. It, it's called thermodiffusion, thermodiffusion, and it is a possible path for organizing molecules into function that can transfer energy and replicate. That is, it's going to cause some organization, this property of, of, of thermo, uh, thermodiffusion. And there are other examples that are like this. Uh, so th this is order from disorder, or thermodiffusion, or it's, it goes by the Sore effect or the ludwig sore effect, because Carl Ludwig, the physiologist, he did this 150 years ago. He, he demonstrated this principle of, of thermodiffusion. And, and it goes like this. And it's best done by example. If you have two chambers, uh, and, and they're c connected here, so there's free movement, and if you have a heavier nitrogen gas and a lighter hydrogen gas in here, of course, if the temperature, if there is no temperature differential, they're uh, distributed randomly between the two tanks, okay? And this would be mac maximal entropy, maximal disorganization. Organization would be moving away from entropy. But this strange thing that if you heat this and put a gradient, like from 10 to 5 on here, and with thermodiffusion, the heavy move from hot to cold. And so here, you have the lighter over here and the hotter and the colder, uh, and, and over here in the cold, the heavier. And so now you have increased macroscopic entropy, heat moving from where it is to where it isn't. And now you're getting organization. Okay. So Carl Ludwig, who first did this, he says, this is important for life. Carl Ludwig, back in the 1860s, said, this, 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 this is important for explaining part of the non-equilibrium you know, features, features of life. And he thought it was important. That's why he did the experiment. And we've been messing around with it. And Ilya Prigogine formalized a, 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 a lot of this. And so uh, mechanism of thermodiffusion, um, it, it, it's still debated. Uh, Dieter Braun, I, I'll only point out his work, 
he published relatively recently here, Why Molecules Move Along a Temperature Gradient, trying to come up with fundamental uh, theory for it. Because, you know, if, if heat creates a, a gradient and gradients are associated with with, with complexity, then you, you take the next step and the next step. But this is what Ilya Prigogine said. Be, be careful. It's hard for us to, 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 to view this. He, he equated with no different than being in the quantum world of teleportation and superposition. He says it's not anything that you can relate to. And in the quantum physics world, you, you, you can't. There, 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 there is nothing that we can relate to in the quantum world except statistically. Um, th Thermodiffusion is indeed proposed as... as a force or the force underlying the initial assemblage of molecules. And once again, Dieter Braun wrote a paper called Thermal Forces, the Thermal Force Approach to Molecular Evolution. And he takes this as a driving force that could do it and sort of does it. But it, it's, the, it's the magical step, you know. It's the magical step that, that no one quite understands. But, but Lauren Cope didn't want us moving on without making some statement about our complexity. Um, so. All right, so, so what? Well, we, you know, the idea is to take these ideas and try to put them together to come up with, with something that's helpful with our thinking. So we took the ideas of Krebs, Mitchell, Pauling, and Prigogine to come up with this condensed statement. Evolution was underwritten by obligatory energy dissipation mechanisms, that is, entropy. Emergence of complexity was coupled to the high energetic nature of oxygen metabolism, and these statements form the basis for the energy transfer hypothesis, at, at, at least for us. That is, variation in energy transfer metabolism, the central mechanistic determinant of the divide between health and disease, because it's so embedded and entrenched to how we evolve. We thought, you, you can't know anything about disease unless you know how you evolved in a very fundamental way. And so th this is, our, this is our, our grasping at this, trying to understand it, to, for hypothesis building and, and to have explanatory notes of what's going on at a higher, higher level, other than just looking at another pathway, taking it in or taking it out, and not decreasing the, the confusion. So that, that's our goal. Um, and of course, we reason that divergent artificial selection of the rats would, 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 uh, would be, be a, a thing that gets played out from this. OK, back, back to biology and, and what, we, what we did with it. In 1966, we indeed started artificial selection uh, for energy transfer capacity, and I went through this. And here, in, in the orange are, are the lows, and here's over here are the highs. And uh, energy capacity uh, can be operationally divided into two compartments. Uh, so our current phenotype can be is a summation of our innate and our adaptive. It's what we're born with, and then everything you accrue from motion that causes adaptation at, at all levels. This is sort of a simplistic view, just, just, just to compartmentalize and, and to help us think, because uh, the model I'm gonna, we're going to talk about first, indeed, is the innate. It's not training. It's what they're born with. We only test the animals three times in their lifetime to ask, how good is this animal in energy transfer using uh, treadmill, forced treadmill running as a surrogate for that, for that energy? And so this is what I'll... I'll take you through. And energy transfer was estimated from a speed ramp treadmill run to exhaustion. Indeed, this is the rat equivalent of, of the Bruce protocol that we invented. The details are really somewhat unimportant other than its ramp that gets ever more difficult. Uh, it's increased by one meter every, every two minutes. We used the NNIH heterogeneous rat stock as the founder population, and they were assessed for intrinsic capacity, tested three times when they're 11 weeks of age, taking the single best day run as being equivalent to their genetic component of, of their running, not, not the average in any way. It, it, was, it sounds, usually geneticists tell you to take more information to decide about your system, but we had arguments that you take the one best day, and it seems like we've won on this, because you'll see it, the selection was highly uh, successful, and th yeah, I'll, I'll explain to you. This is not trained. People think that we're taking animals and training them. Th th this, is, this is what could be called the entrance uh, feature. And h here's selection. Hey, sorry. That's all right. Uh, by definition, by uh, n players and one means n time. Say it again. By, by definition, and n players and one means potential for training. So why did you go for three? Was it three consecutive oh, three days? days? Oh, OK. Um, I, I, initially, up until generation 12, we did it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. 
okay, a, a, across five days to estimate. And then when they started running so long, we couldn't, the, the technicians, they would have quit. It was such a, such a workload, so we went to Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And the reason for, for those three days is the ester cycle of, of a rat is spread across five days, and we wanted to do it across five days, the estimates, so that dropped out as a variable. That, that was really the, the, it was a very, very practical rationale. Uh, so for five days, and then it became practical and dropping into three days, because we, we, we couldn't keep up with the workload. It was just getting too too intense and too expensive. Yes? Oh, yeah. The, the, this, this is a combination of males and females lumped together. Uh, bottom line is f females, uh, they're easier to educate them to run on the treadmill. More of them as a population are willing to, and they also run better. About 10%. About I, I, I don't have any data to break them up, but, but the females are better runners. This is, this is oftentimes found within inbred strains. People, people are testing that the, the uh, and in our hands, in 12 different inbreds, the females generally do better as runners. They're, they have a lighter carcass for, for, for one thing. So here's uh, selection across time, 14, about 14,000 animals. Here's the maximal running distance. Uh, and here's uh, across, represented here, 35 mm -hmm. generations going from 1996 up until 2014. In yellow is the founder population. They exhausted at about 350 meters, if you will. And then here's coming down. Th th this way, it doesn't look like much of a drop, but it goes from 350 to about 200. Fractionally, of course, that's a, that's a, that's a huge drop. Uh, uh, but the, the, the big increase was, was in the highs because they went from 350 up to over uh, 2,000 meter, meter runners. So we clearly have models that divide out. And as you'll see, they divide out for health and disease. But this is, this is what we were after initially. This is the fundamental phenotype. Every rat gets phenotyped. Every rat that we, that, that we, that we send out, uh, you, you, there is no permanence in biology. Be, be real, the lesson for us that we've learned, even for inbreds, they are not impermanent. They, they can change. There's been a, a horrible lesson uh, learned from dull salt sensitive rats and people studying them and not phenotyping them. And, Studies unraveled in the world, especially at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and, they go, and all of a sudden, the, the dull salt sensitive rats lost their salt sensitivity, and no one knows when. Now, talk about the ways people, are, the criticism is, your, your model's too work intensive. And, and I go, no, no, we're not going to ship rats out to collaborators and have them waste their time. Every rat we send out has a label on its head, and, and it's two types of things. On, on your clip with a number on it, and a running capacity is an estimate of, of their capacity. We, we want collaborate and other fundamental infor information. What happened at uh, generation before they Don't know. Don't know. We, we have no explanation for that. Uh, the, the pedigree for this, I, I should have really brought a picture of the pedigree. It, it, is, it is complex and big, and it was put together, and every rat was accounted for with its, with its, with its parents from which we could calculate the, the heritability, and we looked back through records, change in institution, tech, feed. We looked at every record. There was a graduate student that, that's doing this for his dissertation. He's been working on it for, for five years. That's a, that's a good question, but it's just uh, you know, we don't have a concrete answer for it. I have just a quick question. Um, I may have missed this, but uh, were, you, were you selectively breeding and selecting for the trait uh, in each generation, or is this as Spontaneously, every, every generation, every rat gets run. Yes, but when you when you breed, so when you bred each generation, were you selecting for um, high performing animals? Or okay, yeah. so you were you were yeah. actually every, every, every generation would at every generation of the practical sense we we, we pick thirteen. Uh, it, it's it's within family selection. You got thirteen sure. families, and you pick within each family the male and the female that run the best. The same, the same for the low performing. Same for the low. So there's a there's a couch potato limit there. So there essentially, is. there's you can't get worse than. <laughs> is that is that right? Well, <laughs> the, the reality is it is that uh, we have a, a threshold that the rats have to pass to be included. We knew this from day one that we did not want to have zero runners. Zero runners. We were trying to think out. Well, what does that mean? It's how, how do you grade them? Yeah, sure. And so. We, we, we got rid of zero runners because we never wanted this going to zero. We, we saw that as a, as a real problem. And so sure. there's about, 
Uh, for males, there, there's about 4 to 5 percent of, of the whole population. We call them non-rudders, or, or the, the text call them the buttheads. The, the males just don't behave very well. And only about 1 or 2 percent of the females. But we're breeding that out. We get fewer and fewer non-runners all of the time, because it's a threshold test. It's a minimal threshold test that they try to, that they have to pass during the first week of educating them <coughs> running on the treadmill. Yeah. And what is, what is um, failure? So when, when you okay, they're, they're, they're excluded, in, and it's in a 2001 paper, the details of it, but essentially uh, during week 10 of their life, you, you put them on the, the treadmill, gradually running them up, and if they can't do five meters uh, at the rate of five meters per minute for 10 minutes, they're declared, that's a really slow, they're declared as non-runners, and th they're gone. I, I really wish we would have kept the DNA from them, because we would have had contrasting DNA for, for something. <laughs> I mean... What you, how do you define maximal running okay. distance? Right. It, it's, a, it's an operational definition. Have you ever uh, seen somebody run on a treadmill, the Bruce Cot Protocol in, in humans? And yeah, yeah, they, they get coached and helped, and especially if, you know, I, I, I did this for a while in my career. I helped old people, you know, run on the treadmill, and you coach them and get as much as you can. We applied the same thing to the rats. There's a small shot grid at, at, at the back of the lane, and it's a mild shock that they don't like. And you simply go like this and push them off of it and get them to continue to run by coaxing them, if you will. And, and there's huge error, but uh, across time, that error gets lost when you apply it across 14,000 animals. And for any given animal, it, it could be a mistake. They don't like the handling. Others do like, you know, so it's the serendipity. It, no, it's not serendipity. It, it's the reality of working with something that's conscious. We, we know that this is a part of it. It's willingness to run. It's unwillingness to run. It's every combination of, of, of things. That, you know, they don't like the per perfume of the technician that's running them. They, 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 they got in an argument with their cage. It's the whole thing that we've, we've eaten every, every, everything here. Yes? Uh, you, you don't discard them. Well, uh, up, you'll see. Uh, except for the 13 high and low breeding pairs, up until generation 10, we did discard them, except for a few studies that, that were done. We discarded them because we weren't studying them. And I'll, I'll show you data from generation 10 up to generation 30 of the phenotyping that, that went on. Uh, but we don't discard any in the, in the middle uh, because, as you can see, highs are high, and lows are low, and every one of them gets studied someplace in the world. That's our job, to get them out, out, out to the world, about 1,200 rats uh, per, per year, and we've been doing this successfully since uh, ge generation uh, 10. There was another question. Somebody else have a question? Okay. Um, from the pedigree, we can calculate the her heritability, uh, and indeed, it's, it's not an easy task to do it correctly. We, we got Yu Yu Ren and Jun Lee from our Department of Human Genetics, and they, they use this thing called a AS Remel, and, and it's a, uh, a matrix based uh, maximum likelihood calculation. I, I like the names of the tools that have been developed by Solar and Wombat, are, are two modern variants of this a AS Remel, and it's a, it's a complex relationship. But the total proportion of, of running performance that is due to the additive effects of genes is about 40% in each line, and that's relatively high for a complex trait. But, but of course, you, you can reverse it and go, well, yeah, we've got 40% explained, but that leaves 60% of the phenotype unexplained. But, but that's all right. We're, we're still getting pr pretty, pretty, pretty large transmission. Uh, it, 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 a lot of it is, is just lost in error. Here, here's the the selection again, and this is to point out that here at generation 10, we started phenotyping, and then from generation 10 out to, I'll show you data, from generation 10 to, to generation 30. And so th this was our first estimate, okay? We, we recruited a few people from around the world, uh, a woman at University of Toledo we recruited, and we recruited help from Norwegian University. We thought that Ulrich Wisloff and others there, uh, they were some of the best rat phenotyping people in the world, and so we recruited them, 
and, and here's what we found. And so this is from uh, the effort of Ulrich Vishloff and the LCR, or they were, they're called low, low capacity runners. We, we didn't name them. All we knew is that these were low and that these were high and these were high capacity runners. And we, we didn't put our names on them. We, we just thought it'd be, be perfectly descriptive and unbiased in them. And here, here was the, the, the sort of the clinical profile. This is what we wanted. We wanted to kind of have a clinical profile. And, and the lows had increased body mass, increased visceral adiposity, and you can read these. Blood glucose, serum insulin were higher, triglycerides, free fatty acids, LDL, blood pressure, vascular. They had uh, increased vascular endothelial dysfunction. Sorry, just a question. When the increase is with regards to the high performers, or is it with regards to just the same, or I don't know what other control you could use. I guess it's related to the high, or how do you or define you more or less? Yeah, okay, I can make a general statement, but when you go out and use a standard reference like a Sprague volley or a WKY, okay. the values that we find for the highs are much higher, and the values we find for the lows are much lower, and that relates to clinical phenotypes and most things that, 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 one, one, that one measures. A lot of people have used what they call them reference strains, or they also go back to... Uh, the heterogeneous stock, the N, NIH, those have become popular in the world now as a reference strain. So you can use, we, we usually recommend uh, uh, WKY, uh, Sprague Dolly, or the original heterogeneous stock. And they're, they're always outside. I have a really complicated figure sh that shows just exactly how far outside they, they really are compared to at least 12 inbred strains that we ran. Because that, that was... Those are critical. You know, are we really dividing out? We've got, we have phenotypes here that are like none others that, that we know that exist in, labor, in laboratories. And so the Can HCR... Can I ask one question? Uh, sure. What age were these measured at? Uh, the, the phenotypes? Mm -hmm. uh, at about 16 to 20 weeks of age. We were able to, we were able to ship them out, and they were, they were studied r r relatively soon. We shipped them out at about 14 weeks of age. They stayed for a couple of weeks in, in, in Trondheim. So uh, young adults, um, so the HCR were higher for maximal oxygen consumption, left ventricular weight, left ventricular function, I increased cardiac calcium dynamics, and increased mitochondrial oxidative enzymes in, in skeletal muscle. And so we sort of had a, a, the, the metabolic profile where it looks like they divided out. And essentially, most of these uh, stand the test of time uh, uh, across the, the selection process, and especially as they get older, the clinical phenotypes divide out even further. The highs are resistant to decay, the, the lows decay faster. Yes? Just here and there are different, so you actually measure at both species, but you say like a mitochondrial to enzyme going up here, but down there? Right. It would, be, it would be relative to a Sprague Dolly. There, there's been enough of this done. We, did, we didn't do it here. We were, in, in this particular study, we, didn't, we weren't required to use reference strains, which, which, which surprised me. We, we could have, and we had some data, but we didn't present it because we had minimal data. But from, now it's been, been confirmed from lots of studies that I'll show you. Those that do use reference strains, the reference always essentially ends up in the middle. Well... This is where I can't do justice from, you know, generations 10 on people in the world wanting to study them. We shop. We look for people in the world. We're always looking for collaborators, and we get them. Obviously, there's only two ways. We look for them, and they look, <laughs> and they read the literature, and they, they come to us, and we try to, to march on here because Lauren Cook and I, there was no way we have enough expertise to really make progress. You can't be good at everything, and... and James Watson, one of the things we learned from him is, is, is that good things only come via collaboration. So I'll go around and, and show you this. The LCR, the lows relative to the highs, display this. And I'll start up here at the top. This one is unpublished. It's increased susceptibility to inducible breast cancer, and there's a 5.6-fold difference in tumor multiplicity and all of the other features of cancer development that you can look at. It's a, it's a huge effect. It was done by Sloan Kettering and by Colorado State University in, in collaboration. And this, this, this paper is, is in preparation. And it's, it's testing everyone's knowledge of biology to figure out how, how, how and why to come up with an explanation. And we have some markers uh, of what might be important. 
most certainly there, there's uh, decreased longevity in, in the low runners. There's decreased phosphorylating respiration, decreased hippocampal neurogenesis and, and differences for memory and, and, and learning uh, between them. There's decreased cage activity. That is, the, the, the lows are, are, are not as active in their cages. There's increased susceptibility to inducible ventricular fibrillation. There's increased susceptibility to uh, the damage from induced intracerebral hemorrhage. And most certainly, lows have metabolic syndrome with really high, but in insulins are quite high. Yes? Just curious, you may um, actually be getting to this, but um, has anybody run a lifespan study? Of, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm going to show you some longevity, oh, okay. Interesting. Some longevity curves. That, you know, I'm here. I'm in the center. And we, we, we backed into looking at aging and longevity in the most ungraceful way imaginable. It is, you know this. You know, we're almost sorry we started thinking about aging and longevity. It, it, it drives us crazy, but I'll, I'll end up talking about why we want to continue here. And so metabolic syndrome, here's one of the more profound ones that we knew from the beginning. Increased fatty liver uh, disease, uh, oh, 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 uh, high fat diet, induced obesity, the LCR, they're just, they start to fill the universe. They, they, they just gain, gain weight. Disordered sleep, Alzheimer's like neurodegeneration. Uh, an increased pulmonary hypertension than others that, that are not published yet. There's the what happened to neurodegeneration? It didn't label anything. What happened with the Alzheimer's like neurodegeneration? Is that up in the, oh, yeah. the LCR? Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the, with the neurodegeneration, there were differences in the hippocampus for, there were differences in memory and learning, uh, there were differences in mitochondrial. Uh, function in the hippocampus. Uh, tall proteins uh, were, were downregulated, and then uh, it, it exhausts me. James Russell did this at the University of Maryland. We were really surprised that this, this, this to, the, to the outcome. Do, do you know for those experiments what, what was the control group? Just curious, and maybe it never. For some of these, for the Alzheimer's. Th there, there's control group. For others, there is no control group except for comparing between high and low. Oh, it's high and low. Yeah. Okay. The, 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 the reason, uh, can you, how, how to say this, the reason that this is acceptable, because to ultimately get at gene causation, the thing that you do is you cross the highs and the lows. You're interested in the divide between mm -hmm. the highs and lows. You get an F1 population, you cross those to get an F2 segregating population, and then you phenotype for whatever you want across the segregating population, and then you look for gene phenotype association. And so the, the world, for, if for some of these, if they're not completely divergent for anyone, the world is, is, isn't too, too upset about it. But oftentimes, we do want to know the differences, just, just in the relative sense. Where, where do these fall? Um. Steve, uh, I thought one of the a different big was that uh, there was a difference in the body weight. Is that correct? There is. Yeah. I, I, I how big are we talking? 25% uh, difference. It's pretty. It's pretty. Pretty large. It's about 25%, uh, 20 to 25% for the males, and only about 10 to 12% for the females. And, and the lucky thing with body weight, of course, how much of this is accounted for by body weight? Mathematically, we've backed it out, but we've been able to do biologic experiments because for the females, they're close enough together that we can get uh, uh, weight matched populations and study them, and it accounts for, biologically for the things we've measured. Uh, it, it it doesn't account for much, the differences in body weight. So the food take is also different. Right? Yeah, the, the the food intake um, per gram of body mass, the highs eat more. They have a higher resting metabolism. They have a higher uh, body yeah. temperature. I thought it would be the other way around. I thought the highs had more body fat. They'd be insulated, and the the the, the lows would have a, 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 a small a larger surface to volume ratio, and they would have a hard time holding temperature, but it's exactly the, the opposite. And it's probably re related to their, their brown fat, which I, we're just starting to get data on those. So uh, the highs eat more food per gram of body weight, and they're less efficient. And m metabolically, it's really easy to summarize. The highs are very efficient at lipid oxidation whereas the lows are very inefficient at lipid, lipid oxidation. That is, the highs oxidize lipids, the lows store lipids, and that's probably the, 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 the major 
metabolic thing that, that divides them out. Well, indeed, in three different countries, we have gotten survival uh, curves for rats. This was first done in, in Trondheim, Norway, and it's never been done with, in real large populations. It's always been in 20 and 25, but it's been, been relatively clear. This has been re repeated in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in two different populations, albeit relatively small, and then also in Finland, the Javascula, University of Javascula. We, we come up with essentially the same, the same answer. The, the, the lows, their median age of death is 24 months. For the highs, it's 34.7. The, the other studies didn't quite reach this, this magnitude, but they, it makes the point. We always find uh, the, the differences b b between them. Where, where is the parental spine? Is it? Have you ever pulled the parental spines in the sky? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. It's, it's in the very last slide that I present that, which, that is very revealing. For, for where, because we actually have what could be considered as the founder population that we've done it with. We have uh, N NIH rats, sort of. Uh, I'll show you because it's critical, and, and you'll see you'll see why I wanted to come come to San Antonio because we have a real keen I interest in another model and we, that we want to find out about and answer the question. Does, does exercise increase your longevity? Is there a phenotype and is there a genotype out there where you can clearly show this? And from our read of the literature, we, we think it might improve your health span, but we're not certain about longevity in human populations or in animal populations. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. So maybe you are going to get to this, but I was wondering, do, if you force the LCRs to run, can you reverse any of those phenotypes? No. New data, just out of Javascula, they, they put... Um, the LCR, the intrinsic LCR and HCR, on, on uh, from middle age on, they, they gave them access to running wheels, okay, and caused them to live less long. They lived less long. The, the, that running environment did not help them at all. But the interesting thing about wheel running is is that it, it, a it, it's, there's only one one thing of interest here is that it does not increase their VO2 max. And I, I, I thought that it would. Uh, Ted Garland, is anyone familiar with, with his low, uh, with his uh, rats where he's selectively bred over 86 generations for willingness to run on wheels and, and, and then control lines? And he has enormous differences between them. And I mean running 20 kilometers in, in a night, the high line, and he has four replicate lines, and he finds no difference for aging but then we dig into the literature more and there's no difference in VO2 max. It seems like for many things that we're starting to, to uncover, it, it associates more with type of exercise where you get a change in VO2 max. Um, and, and anyway, I, 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 I can't go, it's data out of, out of Duke that, that, is, that is demonstrating this. Um, Since we are so interested in aging um, and you, you said you had replicates of this work at different sites, and you said it wasn't much different, but how, how different are the data from different sites? Because replication is so important in the survival curve. Right. I'll, I'll show those. Oh, you will show yeah, the other yeah, data? I, I, I've got slides someplace down below. I'll have to sort, sort through them. So when I'm finished, we'll, we, 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 we can look at it. And <clears throat> so it, it, it was, it, this, we hypothesized this to be true. We had to have a hypothesis. We thought, well, maybe this is true, and it did turn out. But here, here's the, 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 the one uh, that surprised us the most, okay? Here's uh, data uh, taken from that. Only we looked at VO2 max across four age ranges, at 15 months, 20 months, 25 months, and then at 34 months. And I'll go through this slowly because uh, th th this is, I, I like this better than any data we've ever, we've ever gathered. There, there, there's something here that, that helps me out. It, it's not too surprising. So here's, here's the lifespan. Of course, you gather the VO2 max and you don't know where to fill in with, with the dot with the corresponding y-axis until they die. So here's data sitting here at 15 months, 20 months, 34 months. And then... Then they die, and then you go back and you fill in the graph. And it's not so surprising that, that at 15 months and at 20 months, and 
you know, from the previous graph, you know that they live longer. But it's within each strain that the VO2 max, I don't, I don't want to use the word predictor, but it associates pretty strongly with the lifespan. So something measured in terms of VO2 max for these <laughs> that is very tight. animals that has a strong association across all of these age ranges. I mean, th this is a long ways out, 15 months. You know, it, it, is it more surprising that it occurs at 34 months of age, this association? I thought it was more surprising that something so far back in time from their death ended up being a predictor. And this, I'm almost glad that this was done in Trondheim, Norway. I, I, you know, I, I'd go, I wouldn't believe my technicians, but, but uh, pardon? It's an nice yeah. Good word. Nice morning. Yeah, yeah. So, somehow I think this is telling us something about what's going on here with the O2 max. That's why when we get new, new data, and data from others, we want to know what happened to the VO2 max. Because I, there, there's lots of other things that are starting. M memory loss learning and, <clears throat> and studies out of Duke where, 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 where they're looking at, at behavior and memory. The, 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 the positive changes only occur for neurogenesis if you get an increase in VO2 max. But anyway, that, that would be another story. Good question. Just a question. So the values for VO2 max were obtained at what point to, you know, to plot your to run your correlations. Say it again. When, when did you measure VO2 max for each of the individuals? When? OK. Me measured at four, four different times. Measured at 15 months of age. Oh, oh OK. Sorry. Okay. 20 months of age, 25 months of age, and then 34 months of age. Did you have a measure for earlier? Yeah. And how, so essentially, this is at that time, but did you have a measure, is this, a, is this something that you measured earlier as well? So it's something that is a... I, I, I can't tell you if in Norway if they have data before 15 months of okay. age. They, they, they may not. I think they would have included it here if, if, if they did. It is, it, this is, of course, a metabolic VO2 max, so the whole, in, the whole animal measurement. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. it's, it's running on the treadmill, you know. Sure. Uh, t taking them... With oxygen exchange. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, they're they're, they're very very good at doing this. Um, Sorry, Steve. I, I, we knew we were going to have a bunch of questions. So, uh, do you know where that oxygen is being consumed in the body? Do you know the the, the predominant <coughs> source sink? I think the presumption would have to be that it's skeletal muscle, because. Uh, the, <clears throat> oh, oh, you mean what, what's the what's the mechanism of, of the total? Of, 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 right. Which tissue? Second one. Uh, is there a correlation with lung capacity? Uh, or right. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. It, 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 Okay, the, the, ma the ma major event that occurs here is increases in stroke volume for total cardiac output as a function of, of delivery. As, as a function of, of um, pulmonary function, if you will, if, and this is a little complex, if you exercise, there's no transcriptional program that increases your pulmonary function. That's, I mean, when I got into this, and Peter Wagner taught this, I don't know if you know, he's, he's the clinic. He's the exercise biologist of the world, and we sent our rats to him. But yet, across selection, there's a DNA program that we selected for where relative to their body mass, the, the highs have larger uh, lungs. And so there's a lung function, there's a heart function, but almost unequivocally, because of the perfusion that's taking place, an overwhelmingly large amount of the cardiac output goes to active skeletal muscle with, with with probably decreases in splatting blood flow, decreases in uh, kidney blood flow, and, and neutral changes in the liver, and no change in heart blood flow. But of course, a large increase in, in, in heart blood flow, but the heart is r relatively small compared to the mass of skeletal muscle. Yeah. So, sort of a Peter Wagner gave us a lesson in fundamental exercise biology, and he applied it to the rat. So do you, do you have um, basal metabolic measurements to show what the delta is for mm -hmm. each animal from sort of the basal oxygen consumption to mm -hmm. the maximum to see if it's a delta change or, or if they're always higher? Yeah. 
the, the, the answer to that is th this comes from James Levine. He coined the term NEAT, non-exercise adaptational thermogenesis. I don't know if you, it's about a 12-year-old science paper where he, he, he wanted to know for, for, for people who are, are going through non-exercise motion, uh, how much of that accounts for their, their, their oxygen consumption and their nutrient use. And so from that, he got interested in, in our rats. And, and, the, and the idea would be, like in his humans, those that have more NEAT, that are more active, just non-exercise and moving around, fidgeting, and he measured. The, the, he got a paper in science because he used ergometers a long time ago and got millions of pieces of data in 12 patients. And so it was sort of, sort of trendy at the time, and it was very cool. He found the same thing in, in, in the rats. The, the, the high rats are, have more cage activity and, and, and utilize more oxygen in, in their cage. And they also have a higher VO2 max, whereas the lows are more sedentary and have a lower VO2 max. Um, but, but still, both their oxygen consumption is, is relatively low you know, c compared to their, to their maximal. Um, so that's the conclusion that, that like, like humans, your VO2 max, and James Levine found that that meat can account for the difference between being obese and non-obese. That was his claim to fame. So the last part, getting down to the end here, and this is something that, that's new for us in this new territory. We, we wanted to follow the same pattern of getting a substrate to be able to study the intrinsic and, and also training. Okay? And, and here, training in a rat uh, means testing him like we did at 11 weeks of age, training him by forced treadmill running across eight weeks, 24 sessions, and then retesting him and looking at that delta. And talk about a killer phenotype when you're going to do it on large populations. You know, that, that, that's, that, that's spread across, what, 11 weeks. So all of your air gets run out across here, trying to find those animals that have high gain and those that have low gain. And we, we call them low response trainers, or LTR, and high response trainers, or HTR. Because we, we picked up on this. I don't know how many of you know the work of Claude, Claude Bouchard. Uh, but in the Heritage Family Study, it provided initial information about large inner individual variation in response to training. And here, this is about four or 500 people. This was done at four locations around the United States, part of the, what's called the Heritage Family. And this, this is the change in VO2 max with 22, wheel, 22 weeks of bicycle training. They know that they train because they had them hooked up to a computer. And here's the individual variation, and it goes from gaining a, a, almost a liter and then coming down to where, and look at this, down here for, for the lows. How long do these people I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. It, uh, adults, they were assuredly adults, and it was replicated in three other places around the United, around the United States. Uh, and so from that, we thought, well, that, that, that's, that's pretty profound. Can we emulate this in the rat world, and can we make a model of, of this? And indeed, here's a, a founder population. This is the, we took distance running, not VO2 max, but distance running with eight weeks of training. And you can see that here's some, but after that eight weeks of training, yeah, they actually do worse. We call these, you know, there's the term insulin resistant. We call them exercise resistant <laughs> rats, just like there are, are people who are resistant to exercise. And, 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 uh, and then, of course, there's a, a larger population that, that responds. And here's, this looks like Claude Bouchard's d distribution. And, and so uh, we selected, jumping right to the selection process across 15 generations, here, here's what happened. The, the blue are the high response trainers. And essentially, it's almost a pure population. And the orange are the low response trainers. And so now we have models to, to study. Um, Two so it's completely separate. We started completely over, had to re-derive N and NIH populations from people that sent us rats from around the world and rebred them to start with the heterogeneous population. And, and we, we started all over. This, this remains as, as, as a non-funded entity. Of course. The, I mean, the, 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 yeah. So, uh, are these, the, when you say a negative, that's... They actually do worse? What's yeah, that, what's what, does that the, mean? what is that? What does that mean? Does that mean uh, they get 
Just, no, just, for the negative. Just, just like for people, every exercise environment doesn't help. There are people in, in which actually go backwards and gain in VO2. Go backwards and gain That's not the There's population. So, 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 but I'm still kind of not, not clear here. These guys just stop running? Is that what that means? Uh, no, they're VO much. Much. Remember, th this was, uh, I, I know, this is a lot it's to take on. But they've, oh, been, they've been tested at, at 11 weeks and then trained for eight and, and then tested again. And you take that delta. What's their delta? What's the gain? And, and but, yeah. th this represents over here, generation after generation, of, of if you will, concentrating perhaps allelic variants that are causative of yeah. not maybe real high training, but getting a positive training effect. And then there's a population that they actually go downhill. And this could be related, as you can imagine, to all kinds yeah, exactly. of things like oh, yeah. re repair mechanisms and motivation. And all the other mm -hmm. things that you Motivation, not <laughs> yeah. depression, and having, got, having the thought of going through another 11 weeks of training. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But this is, this, is, <laughs> this is the group that we know the least of, about. We have a couple of papers published, and I'll show you a little more data, and then I'll, I'll tell you how, how. Go ahead. I, I just have a question about the methodology. So you just give them one training. So, so they're, they're essentially habituated or go through their first experience, and then? Okay. I'll, I'll Back up. Yeah. We, we, it's, it's worse than this because you have to educate them over a week so they'll run on the treadmill yeah. at 10 weeks. At 11 weeks, you, you test them Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for their initial capacity for run. You train them for eight weeks, and then you test them again Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and take that delta. For those that don't okay. gain, it would be so zero gain. Training. The others get two or 300 meters, wow. and, and others do poorly. And, and there's so much variation across time, we didn't think we would get anything, but, but we did. But how does it shake out with the other set of racks? You've got your high and your lows. The high capacity and low capacity. They don't even come across. They don't but are there, is there any, any relationship at all? Are the ones that, the one, are the blue on that end oh. up there? Are okay. they? There, there is no relationship between their initial capacity and their training, just like Claude Bouchard found in humans. Mm -hmm. The initial capacity is, 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 not, a, is, is not a predictor. And, and I'm going to show you. We've taken it across aging, and you would think, well, you haven't done anything because you haven't tested it. We were set up to test something, and I'll, I'll show you. Steve, I'm sorry. I hate sorry. to. Just what is the percent change here? I mean, are you looking at changes of 5% from the initial? Yeah, I know that's a delta analysis, but what was the initial this, this value? Is, this is in meters. Okay. So the initial was how far were they running? So it's a delta of a value. What was that initial value? Okay, the, the, the values would have been uh, variable depending upon what their uh, initial capacity was. Okay. They, they could have gone, okay, I can give you an example. I can't tell you for each individual rat, except this delta is independent of where they started. But like a rat might have run uh, 600 meters before training in, in the first test, and then you train them, and then, and then if they ran 600, that's a delta of 200. They would have gone from here. Up to right. Here. So it's it's in it's in that it's in that range. But it's it's I guess I'm wondering are these changes like a change in two percent of the running initial or is it change in twenty percent of the initial values? I mean is it I mean I guess you know in, in I'm wondering whether these are really significant changes in how far the animals are running or not running, or are they relatively yeah, small I, I, I compared don't like to, to do this in the relative sense and be accurate off the top of my head well, from, from looking at these data. One way is if you know approximately what kind of, at the starting point, what the average distance an untrained rat will right. run. Right. Is it 200 uh, meters or is it 5,000? These, these are going to be about seven, 800 meters. Okay. Yeah, about 700, seven, 800 meters for, for, for the uh, initial, not nearly as high, because they, they haven't been selected. These are just, just or, ordinary N, NIH rats. So, so these are big changes uh, in that initial. Well, yeah, they're they're percentage-wise, they're 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 pretty big changes, um, and so here's filling this out. The difference is eight minutes longer and two point five minutes. But this is a ramp protocol. So <clears throat> then, uh, in help with Norwegian U University, uh, we were able to look at at some cardiac function, and and w one of the things we were interested in, and one of the things we can m measure. Ulrich Wisloff is very good at is, uh, is remodeling of the heart. And here's just the bottom line. Here are the LRTs. Here's their value of, of, of running in VO2 max before being trained, and they went across training, and they got no change in VO2 max, the training. They were, all of them were exercise resistant. I think this was 
like a generation six, you know, I, I can't tell you what generation, it was out, out of ways. And then here's, for the high response trainers, they got a, a big response and then he did all kinds of things related to cardiac function and the hearts, they, they, they had no positive effect. In fact, it was all negative effects in, in, in terms of isolated card cardiomyocyte function. So it looks like we've got a model. Now, I'll, I want to explain in, in simple terms uh, something for you to, to ponder and to help us out. Lauren Koch and I uh, c cannot really think that there's good data saying that exercise makes you live longer. Uh, health span, maybe, but making you live longer is, has been more difficult. And just because athletes live longer doesn't, doesn't mean anything. They may have lived longer anyway. And those that have done it, we, we operate some, somewhat with the twin registry in, in Finland. And so you can find identical twins that are disparate for their running. And guess what? There's no difference in their age. It, it only ended up being 340. You know, you, you don't end up with, with, with a lot of, of twins for which you can gather the, the, these, these data. Okay, so that, that's one thing. And we, we can't find clear examples of, of, of this in the literature, but we think we're set up because, and, and this is my ending slide, and then I, I got one more, just to remind you what we have. Uh, they're maintained as an international resource by the Department of Anesthesiology and the National Institute of Health. And we have low-capacity runners and high-capacity runners, and then the low trainers and the high trainers, and we make these available for study, and, and we're, we're looking for collaborators for study and institutions that want to help us to endow these as a, as a resource for the, for the world. Skipping, the NIH is getting more difficult to deal with, We're, you know this, you're, you're always flapping in, 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 in the danger zone. We, we, we think Michigan is going, going to help to endow this somewhat. We're looking for partners and we're most certainly looking for collaborators. That data, actually there's a negative response trend, right? So in, instead of in the middle, you have a no response trend, you have a high, but you have a negative one. So I just wonder, for those negative ones, actually exercise is harmful? Yeah. To them. For, for at least that phenotype. What we don't know, of course, is how, how, how does it relate to other things? Like is it improving their, their, their metabolic profile? Just, you know, we don't have enough data yet. That's the, that's the new world for us. I, I, don't, I don't think that's correct. Right? It's not necessarily harmful. It's just that they don't run. Oh, they, they, they do run. They just don't get much of a delta. Well, no, the negatives, they're not necessarily unwell. They just don't like running, right? Oh. I, I, I would say it's like in human populations, it's, it's always... Well, but, but I mean, they're not necessarily sick, put it that way. They're not necessarily made worse by the training. <coughs> that's the point. Uh, I, I would say if you expand out your, your definition of what negative is, I, I would say if you were to do something to a human that makes them less willing to run, that's a negative clinical outcome. I mean, you know, in, in the most expansive sense. Is it... Is, is I wouldn't, but anyway... Do you have, for instance, any like um, activity data or levels of anxiety that the uh, animals might, you know, differential experience um, in the training environment? Yeah, uh, the, the highs are more active in their cages, so there could be a small component of self-training. It, it's it's not big, you know, with their spontaneous activity, but but it's it, it, it's always there and it's always con consistent. Even in the system where you're, um, is that, you know, not for your... Um, oh, you're talking about in, the trainers? Yeah. Don't, don't know yet. Don't, don't have those data yet. It's being acquired right now in Javascript of uh, Finland. Yeah. Uh, do you have um, body mass, body composition for the, uh, for the training oh, deltas? I'll show you some data. We completely lucked out. And I'll, I'll show you on, on practically every front. There's no difference in body mass uh, that occurs here, and there's no difference in longevity when they're unprovoked. Yeah. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll show you one. There's a question, I believe, at the top. Oh, okay. Yes, I uh, see. Uh, so you, you ma your major measurement is about exercise. How about the other parameters, like uh, you know, heartbeat rate? at uh, rest and body temperature. Somebody asked the uh, lean mass, but um, do you do other correlations? Uh, you know, the heart rate, the blood pressure, the body composition, are those correlated with uh, longevity as well? Or just, uh, you know? 
for, for the I don't long know how run. much other data you have. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we don't have a lot of other, other data. Uh, w there's a paper published in Circulation Research in 2011 that I refer you to. The first author is uh, Ulrich Wisloff. Lauren Koch is the last author. It's a pretty e e easy paper to find. And th there's where the phenotyping is. I, I can't do it accurately off the top of my head. It's a pretty complex paper done with, with Hopkins and Norwegian University. Uh, but we do, have, we do have other correlates that are in there, and most certainly with inflammatory response. Is there a gender difference in your analysis, like male rat versus female rat? Uh, no, I, I don't think we were, had enough of a population to be able to divide, divide out uh, sex differences. Because overall, in human, females live longer than, right. than males. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. So anyway, th this, is, this is what we have. And now I want to, the, the last slide, I want to show you something. This is j just r recent. Here, here's a, a, a repeat. This is uh, obviously survival curves. And here's the data we showed before. Here's for the HCR, high capacity runners, in eight. And then here's for the low capacity runners. Uh, this is when they're in eight. And then the blue and the orange are, are the low response trainers and the high response trainers. Th these are un unprovoked. Okay, they haven't been trained, all right? And, and we, we thought, and there's no difference in body weight, which is not, it won't be a confounding factor, and there's no difference in longevity between the two. Now we want to take these because we have, is there, are there genotypes and phenotypes? And the hypothesis would be, and we've sort of stacked the deck, but we want to know, is there a genotype, phenotype, which when you train them, it increases their longevity? And we think this might be true, that we've captured some of this in, in the high response trainers, and a negative aspect for this in the low response trainers. So these might divide out. And the high response might move in this direction and the low response in this direction so that we would have at least one I I example that perhaps can, can be studied to try to find this, this out. Human populations, it may be there, but you'd have to go to the extremes of something. And that's something we don't know what, what it is yet. But here, clearly in the rat world, we could start to get the first approximation of this and indeed Lauren Cook is writing a, a grant on this, and we're trying to get this, this off of the ground. Um. So is, are the HCRs all HRTs? We don't know. So you haven't, you haven't looked at, you haven't taken your HCRs and just put them on the profile to see if they are all HRTs? <clears throat> so the HRCs, do they always, are they high responsive trainers, I guess, is my question. Yeah, we've divided out the population, the, the high response trainers by, by, by definition, essentially it's a pure population where the, the, they're, they're going to train and get a positive effect, whereas you put the low response trainers through training, they either get a very small effect or a negative effect of, of, of the training. No, I, I was wondering about the other strains. So you have the LCRs and the HCRs. Are the HCRs also HRTs? No. I mean, are they also have the ability no. to be high response trainers? No? No, b b both of them train. Okay, that, yeah. Uh, the NHs, the HCR and LCR, it hasn't been studied it, it, it extensively, but, but those that, ha that have looked at training, not on wheels, but on treadmills, you get a training response out of both. In our original science paper, that's, that's some of the information that, that we, we provided. They, they, but they haven't been selected. They've been selected for their intrinsic, and so they differ widely for that. We didn't expect them to differ much for, for, their, for their training, and indeed that's what happened. But you do get a positive training effect out, out, out of both. And th this is where it, it, it becomes impossible to do it correctly. Okay, and, and I'll tell you why. Because if you take HCR and LCR and train them uh, r relative to their capacity, uh, of course, you're pressing those HCR dramatically. And so in the absolute sense, you're going to get a higher training response because they're just starting off from completely different baselines. If you were to train them in the absolute sense, one could say you're not pressing the HCRs at all because you have to adjust your absolute training. You do it in the LCRs, see what they can do, and then you apply that lower one than you would have used had it been absolute. And we, we had, this was about 10 years ago, and we had all of the exercise biologists. We, we had visitors from, from Finland, we had visitors from Norway, and we, we gathered on the kinesiology campus we were going to argue this thing out. How, how, how do you do studies when you're, and what's appropriate for using 
absolute training, where it's like you train them all exactly the same, or, or is it relative? And no, no one had an answer that couldn't be criticized. And so what, what you do is you use both and try to figure it out if you really want to, want to get at it. Because every time we would go to do it, someone would say, well, you did it wrong. Well, you're wrong every time. Yes? It, it, it's unknown. Those N NIH rats have not been studied as a population uh, for, for longevity, to my knowledge. So what, what do they mean by NIH? Uh, okay, it, it's, uh, it was Carl Hansen. He's a geneticist that worked for the NIH in the, in the Division of Comparative Medicine, and he was one of their staff geneticists. Okay, and uh, it used to be that, that these people would, would collaborate with investigators from from extramural sites. And he invented these, he and uh, Karen Spuler, back in the 70s. And they thought this was a wonderful thing that they were making for the world, to have this substrate that's heterogeneous and lots of people would take off and selectively breed and do like we did here. And we're about the only ones that took off on it. And Carl, Carl, but Carl Hansen was so nice to us. You know, he was so excited. He was relatively senior. And he was a great advisor for us in giving us advice on, on, how, on how to take this on. Um, I, I don't think anyone ha has ever taken a, it would be very expensive to answer a question that's not really testing a hypothesis. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That, that's, that's one of the points I meant to make because here these were, tra these were bred for training and not intrinsic. Okay, and here they've been neither, they haven't been trained and so these are about as close as you can get to N NIH rats. It's a little tricky. Th yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I, I, meant, I meant to make that point. Do you have any uh, pathology data on, on these lifespan studies? We, 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 we do. And it's everywhere. Okay? Every one of these rats uh, had, had pathologies done, autopsies, if you will. And it was some of this and some of that. And there was nothing lined up, which made us very happy because if most of them had lows had been dying, like you know, a pituitary tumor. It would have been very exciting, but only for a few people in the world. So it, it sort of di distributed a lot, you know, with, with no particular thing. As we go into further, we want to we want to re re refine our, our 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 pathologies. Yeah. Uh, if people want to leave, uh, they're welcome. Uh, we're over time here, but by all means, stick around because we'll have the um, uh, conference on for about another half an hour, I think. So, Steve, I have another question. Um, so, exercise clearly uh, improves insulin sensitivity, and hyperinsulin linear actually is linked uh, with uh, all kinds of. Uh, you know, aging-related diseases. Uh, in your case, do you have a just simple measurement of the blood insulin level in this exercised uh, rat? Uh, for the trainers? Yeah, for, for the entire population. Would you be able to tell whether the exercised one would have a lower uh, fasting insulin level versus the uh, low responder? Yeah, the, the best thing, we have a paper in, in diabetes done with Larry, with Lori Goodyear, and they, they took the highs and lows and, and, and trained them just for two days, okay, and then looked at their, in, they looked at angiogenesis, this is just over two days of, of training, and then they looked at, at insulin responsiveness, and, and the exercise in the high trainers made them more insulin sensitive by just applying two days of exercise, that's how, that's how much they divide out for their sensitivity to training. So that's, that's the only information we have right now. We published that about a, about a year ago. Okay. Um, what about, you, you showed, at the, one of the very early slides you showed uh, indicated that the um, LCRs were larger weighed more than the HCRs. 
over the aging of these two groups, do they gain more weight? You have to go back and look at the paper. Pardon me? Yeah. I'd have to refer you back to the, the circulation research paper. I, I, I haven't retained those in my memory. Sorry. No. We, we, it, 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 it ends up being we, we help design and we write the papers and then ultimately the stuff fades as, as Lauren Coke badgers me more about fundamental theory. She said that's what, she, she doesn't want us to do the same as anyone else in the world. Her mantra ha has always been, we've got to do something that distinguishes and makes us different. So, so let's, let's, let's do that. And so we spend an awful lot of our time arguing about our, our dark side. So have you looked at the compared oxidative damage between the LCR and HCR? The oxygen what? Oxidative damage level of like in you know, the DNA, oxidative damage DNA protein or lipids? No. Because, uh, because uh, I, you know, I would assume, because the HCR uses a lot of oxygen, right? You know, you would think that would have higher level of oxidative yeah, damage, but, they, they, but, they, but they, in fact, it could be the opposite. It could be, have, you know, because they may have a more efficient mitochondria uh, oxidative metabolism. Yeah.